the comments, the opinions expressed in the podcast are those of Ms. Cranley alone and are intended for educational purposes only. She's an investment advisor representative with PM Square Financial, a state registered investment advisor based in Fort Worth, Texas. The comments and opinions of those of Ms. Cranley's do not necessarily reflect those of myself or the Real Estate Syndication Show. However, the presentation is for educational purposes only. And then also as an investor, it's really important to remember, it's an extremely volatile asset. Bitcoin is volatile and the other ones are even more volatile. The, the smaller the market cap, obviously, the bigger the swings. And so what you generally see is when Bitcoin goes up, the other cryptocurrencies sometimes go up faster, but when Bitcoin goes down, the other ones crash harder and they don't always come back. So if you were to go back, Bitcoin, because of the halvening cycle that we talked about last year, there's a general four-year pattern where there's you know one year where it tends to run up a lot and then come down a bit and then runs up again. Christine, welcome back to the show. Honored to have you just to continue a few segments here as we dive into a topic that we all need to know more about, as we talked about yesterday. And, and you went into, obviously, your background in Bitcoin and decentralized versus centralized and what that means and the peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, it gives a great testimony to why we need to know more about Bitcoin and potentially invest in it ourselves, right? But even went into the technology, right, and why it's remarkable. It's, it's so remarkable how it works and how it's almost something that crime is almost... I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's, you know, it's almost so difficult, right? That it's, you know, almost not a problem. And I just appreciate how you went into that. I wanted to begin today with, you know, what else should investors know about cryptocurrencies before they invest in it, right? And then I want to get into the current state of cryptocurrency and real estate. And so I know that a lot of them are wondering about that specifically, but what else do we need to know before we invest in something like Bitcoin? Absolutely. That's a great question. And just as a disclaimer, as even though I'm a financial advisor, none of this is intended as financial advice. <laughs> it's just for educational purposes only. But there are some really good things to keep in mind as you're thinking about investing. So first of all, it's important to remember that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are not the same thing. So they're both built on blockchain technology but they're understood very differently within the SEC because Bitcoin is decentralized. And so Gary Ginsler of the SEC, he taught a whole class on it on MIT. It's actually a fantastic class if you want to look it up on YouTube. And he talks all about Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrencies. But he's classifying it as a commodity. It's also been, the IRS has also called it as a property, but it's basically a store of value Coin. So a lot of people think of it as gold 2.0. And so some of the same things that they would look to with gold to preserve wealth, a lot of people look to Bitcoin in that way. Whereas the other cryptocurrencies are more centralized and you can think of them more like technology startup companies. And so I think, I believe that they have a lot of promise but it's very important to remember that we are very, very early in a lot of that technology. So currently there's about over 10,000 different coins and token offerings. Most of them are in their infancy stage. Most of them will probably go to nothing. So they talk big, but you have to look at what's actually being developed on them and look at the team that's putting it together the use case, if it's a smart contract platform, the number of projects that are being built upon it. Ethereum has the most, but Solana, Cardano, they're competing for that. And then also as an investor, it's really important to remember, it's an extremely volatile asset. Bitcoin is volatile and the other ones are even more volatile. The, the smaller the market cap, obviously, the bigger the swings. And so what you generally see is when Bitcoin goes up, the other cryptocurrencies sometimes go up faster, but when Bitcoin goes down, the other ones crash harder and they don't always come back. So if you were to go back, Bitcoin, 
because of the halvening cycle that we talked about last year, there's a general four-year pattern where there's, you know, one year where it tends to run up a lot and then come down a bit and then runs up again. And when that happens, if you go back in 2017 and 2013, all the times it ran up, look at the other cryptocurrencies that were popular during that time. And a lot of them you don't even hear spoken about today. So we're still at the beginning of this kind of tech startup revolution where people are building a blockchain technology, but there's still a lot to, of kinks to be worked out and we don't know who the winners are. So what I generally tell people is if you find a project that you believe in, generally the best strategy is to buy in slowly over time. So just dollar cost average into the project. Don't try and time the market. It's very difficult to do, but just kind of slowly buying into the projects you believe in is, in my opinion, the best way to enter the assets. No, that's awesome. I think it's great advice. I just wondered a couple of quick questions though. The habiting cycle, is that specific to Bitcoin? Are there others that do that also? Every cryptocurrency is different. And so the word that they use with that is the tokenomics. So what's the tokenomics of each coin? And so there's a couple other coins that have limited supplies, but most of them don't work that way. And so that is one of the unique aspects of Bitcoin. Some of the other ones, especially when you hear spoken about this difference between proof of work and proof of stake, with proof of work, you're having to use power, spend money, use energy in order to create that coin. Some of these other ones are proof of stake. And this again shows kind of the centralization, why as the SEC is leaning more toward calling them securities. It's because whoever created that coin, maybe they kept a whole bunch for themselves or they sent a bunch to the friends. And so with proof of stake, the idea is, okay, if you've got them, you can lock them up and that's what creates more of them. So they're inflationary coins. And a lot of the coins are very inflationary. They have some schedule of creating more and more coins so you have to kind of look at each one and find out what the tokenomics of them are. There's a good website, Coin Market Cap, and it gives you a lot of good information about each of the projects. And you can find out if they're cap supply or if they have anything similar to the halvening cycle. But mostly that's Bitcoin's. Yeah, that's good to know, or at least a good resource like that to look up. Maybe if they're as they're thinking about investing in different ones and want to know more specifics about what they're investing in, right? Because it sounds like they can be very different, Bitcoin versus Ethereum or Doge or whatever it may be. So let's move into, you know, the, just the current state of cryptocurrency and real estate. And, you know, we're like, I know cryptocurrency is playing a role in the real estate industry, but maybe you could shed some light there on specifically how and in commercial real estate. Absolutely. So there's a couple different areas where cryptocurrency and real estate are learning to play together. And I think the one you'd think of most off the bat would be, are people buying real estate with cryptocurrency? So you have these people that are Bitcoin rich and they bought their coins when they were one cent. And so are they purchasing property with them? And is that even a possibility? And the truth is, at least in the United States, it doesn't happen a whole lot for a number of reasons. It has been done. It can be done. But there's a couple reasons why we're not really there yet where people are buying property with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies so much. And part of the reason is, let's say you have a property list and you could say, well, I'll take Bitcoin or dollars. Well, generally, you're going to find more dollar buyers more quickly than you are a Bitcoin buyer. Now, maybe that's different if it's a super high end property that don't move so quickly, you know, several million dollar property and you want to kind of give it a little extra glamour by saying, oh yeah, and we'll take Bitcoin for it. Maybe you'll draw some attention that way. But again, with the Bitcoin community, most of the people understand Bitcoin as a store of value and they're not going to give away their coin. You're never going to rip their coins out of their hands. So there's a funny story. So there's a thing called Bitcoin Pizza Day because the first transaction that ever happened with Bitcoin was a man bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. And so the 10, community always Bitcoin. kind of, oh. yeah, I mean, think about how much money that is today. 
for the 10,000 Bitcoin that he bought his pizzas with. And so, you know, people just kind of have that in mind, like, okay, well, it's worth $23,000 today, but what if it's worth $100,000 in a couple of years? And so do I really want to make the trade? Now, like I said, it can be done. You're going to need a real estate agent who understands how Bitcoin transaction works. So how to work the wallets. You're going to need a crypto real estate attorney that's versed in those things. You'll need some sort of third-party escrow that can transfer and hold the coins, which can be done. So there's things called multi-signature wallets. It's kind of like at a bank where there's two different keys to the lockbox. There's ways to hold coins where there's three different keys and you need two of them to move. So it can be done. It has been done. It doesn't happen a lot in the U.S. Another reason is tax-wise, if you are just going to sell your Bitcoin versus give someone or you buy something with Bitcoin, I'm not a tax lawyer, so don't quote me on this, but as I understand it, you're going to pay the same taxes either way. So if you've got enough Bitcoin that you're willing to spend a house on it, you've probably got a lot of capital gains appreciation on those coins. You probably got them, a whole bunch of them, a long time ago. So, I mean, unless it's something that's under the table, if you're going to do it over the table and the way that it you know, should be done, then you're going to have to pay the taxes either way. So there's companies such as BitPay where they'll convert your crypto into dollars right away. So the seller can receive dollars and it ends up being a bit less of a hassle. Now, that's the United States. You may have been hearing when Russia invaded Ukraine and they froze the assets of a lot of the oligarchs over there. From what I understand, a lot of those oligarchs went to Dubai and bought real estate with their Bitcoin there. And so because those assets are not able to be frozen, if you own the keys, if you have control of the passwords and the keys that make those coins move, nobody can freeze them. And so it does happen in other countries, especially if you're from a sanctioned place that people do buy real estate that way. So that's one, which is purchasing real estate with Bitcoin. But another thing that a lot of the Bitcoin community opts for is leveraging their cryptocurrency for a purchase. So with this, you basically lock up your cryptocurrency with some lender and get a loan with that as collateral. And a lot of these crypto back loans, they tend to have high interest rates. And you do run the risk that if Bitcoin plummets by 80, 90%, as it is does at times, <laughs> as we saw recently, then you're going to need more Bitcoin or more assets to pledge if you don't want your Bitcoin margin called. Now, there is a company that I'm aware of. I think they're in Canada. I don't know if they're here yet called Ledin, L-E-D-N. Again, I'm not affiliated with them, but as I understand, they are kind of promoting these loans to buy real estate with, and they will count the Bitcoin or whatever crypto as 50% of the collateral. And they'll also count the home itself as 50% of the collateral. So that's a second way where you're using cryptocurrency, an asset that you have and leveraging it to get into real estate. That's interesting. I don't think I've heard of that before. There's lots of ways that you can take out a loan with crypto but there's always risks to it. So recently, Celsius was a common place where you could get a crypto back loan. And they recently went into bankruptcy because with the market so down and everything's on the blockchain. So you can even see where people's margin calls hit. And because we talked yesterday about so little liquidity on the exchanges, you can manipulate that price and make it go down and cause people to be liquidated and a lot of bloodshed out there. And so there's always a danger with locking up your coins anywhere because Celsius, when they went bankrupt, they're sending notes to all the people that had assets there, like, sorry, we can't pay you back. There's no insurance, like they're ours and they're gone. And so, so sorry. So I do think in the future, we're going to have more and more crypto backed, but with you know, there's always a trade-off when you give someone else your coins and trust them to them. Wow. 
Yeah. And I was going to bring this up a little later, but I want to ask you now, since you mentioned that, would that be as opposed to say, keeping them in your own wallet or owning them, you know, through a different platform or just speak a little bit into that? Absolutely. So there's this saying in the Bitcoin community, not your keys, not your coins. And so having your own wallet, especially if it's something offline, like a cold card or a ledger wallet or a treasure wallet, where it looks like a USB device. It's not that the coins are on the device because the coins are on the ledger, but whoever has the signature password to move the coins is the one that owns them. If you can move them, you own them. And so if you have your coins on an exchange, they are the ones with the private keys. They are the ones with the passwords. If someone like, we often hear about, well, the government, there was something illegal that happened. And so they came in and they got those coins back. Well, what they did was they called up whoever those criminals were, they had them on the exchange and they called up the exchange and they're like, send them to us. And then the exchange sent them to them. And so that's different than when you take those coins into your own possession. And there's risks in, in, involved with both, right? You have to have good security practices with, when you do that, but preferably with the signature offline so that you're the one that has access to it. And just a little fun story about Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever this mysterious figure was that started Bitcoin. So there's a lot of talk about who it is. And there's people that have come out and claimed that they were him. And But the thing is, those coins, nobody, he or she or they mined a bunch of coins at the beginning. They have, I think about 5% of the network is owned by that person, that entity. But no, they have never moved. Those coins have never, ever moved. And so someone recently was telling everyone that he was Satoshi Nakamoto. And people are like, move the coins, show us. And they've never moved. So yeah, that's... That's interesting. It's neat that, hey, there is a way for you to prove to us that you're the one, right? That's so cool. Any other, I'd say, barriers standing in the way for investors buying real estate that maybe we haven't talked about, you know, with cryptocurrencies or anything else related to real estate and cryptocurrencies that maybe things you see coming in the future that maybe we could be aware of, or I don't know, you know, anything like that, that's maybe going to even make the process easier to use cryptos and buy real estate? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is a third way where property and cryptocurrency meet. And I think it's very promising. And I do think it is the direction that we will be going in the future. And that involves the tokenization of the property so that it can be basically fractionalized into the equity shares or fractionalized into a number of tokens and purchased and held by multiple owners. So their equity share is represented by a digital token and it's recorded on the blockchain. And so in effect, it's a way of crowdfunding a property. Now, as we spoke about earlier, these would be considered security tokens and as such, they fall under the governance of the SEC. And so this kind of setup is not at this point approved in the United States for retail. However, it is being done through a 506C exemption investment structure through at least one company that I know of in Texas called OwnProp. Now, I'm not affiliated with OwnProp. I just discovered them recently, but I thought of you when I discovered them because I think it's along the lines of what we wanted to talk about today. So I'm not recommending, but it's interesting what they're doing. So they're actually making strides in this area of tokenizing real estate and they already have properties that are open for investment and but again it's just for accredited investors they're working it sounds like they're trying to work with the sec to get it open to retail but right now it's just for accredited investors and for those that purchase shares in the form of tokens those owners are entitled to dividends based on the income generated by the property. I believe OwnProp pays that in dollars at this point. And I think I saw something, they might be moving to stable coins in the future. But the reason this is interesting, there's a number of value propositions to this idea of tokenizing real estate. So just to kind of like expand your thinking about where this can take us. So first of all, it makes an illiquid asset liquid. 
and you eliminate the fees theoretically associated with the transfer of title. So you don't have the closing costs, you don't have the real estate agents, you don't have the title insurance. So it eliminates a lot of middlemen in these transactions. And you could theoretically sell it really quickly if one day it's approved for an exchange. And it greatly reduces the barrier to entry. So you can buy property at a fraction of a cost. Theoretically, you could make it as low as a dollar. Whatever you wanted the price of the shares to be or the tokens to be set at. So it democratizes ownership. So even the smallest investor can own real estate assets and they all benefit from the appreciation that happens when money is injected into the money supply. So the, we talked yesterday about the poor and the dilemma for the poor because they don't have assets that appreciate. Well, this is a way to get it out to much more people, especially if it's approved for retail. Again, it's not right now, it's just for accredited investors. But theoretically, you could give ownership shares in the form of tokens to employees who work at the building. I mean, we all know that we treat something better that we're owners of. So similar to giving out stock. That's a big issue in the syndication business is because it's not liquid, right? Investors yes. know they're going to put their hard-earned 50 or 100,000 or half million, whatever it may be, they're going to invest. They know it's going to be there for, say, three to five years or maybe seven years or sometimes longer, right? And so I can see there would be so much value in that, right? If they knew, hey, well, I can probably sell half or all my shares if I needed to tomorrow or a month from now or you know a year from now. And I can decide that versus, hey, I know it's not liquid. And we try to make that very clear up front. So they, they have that yeah. expectation, right? That would solve a lot of problems. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think own prop, I think their minimum investment is $1,000 a token or $1,000 a share. It also enables you to diversify a lot more easier. So with a real estate investment trust, you're buying a clump of properties, but with this, you can pick and choose the properties that you want. Or also, let's say you're the owner of a building and you want to raise money for a wing or you want some of it to be, you don't want to sell the whole thing, but you want some of it to become a liquid for you, you know, or even, you know, kind of like a home equity type thing. If, if you could sell shares in your home, it just enables just whole new frontiers for making an illiquid asset liquid. That's awesome. Well, Chris, I mean, wow. So many things we're learning about Bitcoin and and I can't even remember if I'm saying it right, the halving or the-, the uh, Havening. Yeah, yeah or having. the halving. They say both. Yeah, yeah. Those things I've not heard of before. But even some of the nuances about Bitcoin and how it started, but even to the, what we see in the future potentially of how it may become more liquid or, you know, cryptos or being able to, or uh, real estate syndication may become more liquid and be open to more people because of the technology, right? And how it may be connected, hopefully easier, you know, to real estate in the near future. So grateful for that. I hope the listeners are, I hope you're learning a ton, right? From Christine, I know I am. And I hope you're going to join us again tomorrow. We're going to go in more into Bitcoin mining and real estate. And I've, I've seen numerous offerings to myself from other people about investing in Bitcoin mining. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from Christine about what that is. Is that something I should consider as an investor, you know, or maybe you potentially, you know, as an investor as well as you're listening to this, I hope you are becoming better educated so you can make that decision. We'll see you back again tomorrow. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.